Good morning and welcome to the third meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones, tablets and other electronic uh, devices. The first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. The second item on our agenda is consideration of the Budget Scotland No. 3 Bill at Stage 2. Members have a note by the clerk in their papers. I welcome to the meeting the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, who is accompanied by Terry Holmes and Andrew Watson from the Government's Finance Director. Very warm welcome to you this morning. And I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you, Kavir. This session of the Finance Committee focuses on the content of the Budget Bill itself as approved in principle by the Scottish Parliament. As members of the Committee are aware, there are a number of differences in the presentation of budget information between the Draft Budget and the Budget Bill. In order to assist the Committee, I will explain the main differences with reference to Table 1.2 on page 3 of the supporting document. Column A sets out by portfolio the 2014-15 budget as shown in Table 2.01 of the Draft Budget document published last September. Column J in Table 1.2 sets out the Draft Budget as it is required to be restated for Budget Bill purposes, and Columns B to H provide details of the adjustments, including the necessary statutory adjustments to meet the requirements of the parliamentary process. There are three substantive funding changes to the spending plans outlined in the draft budget. These are recorded at column H and detailed in the introduction section of the supporting document. In all cases, the additional funding reflects the deployment of available consequentials flowing from the UK Autumn Statement of the 5th of December 2013. In summary, the budget reflects the deployment of £38.5 million pounds of additional resource Dell in 2014-15 in respect of the business rates package that I announced to Parliament on the 11th of December 2013. On the 7th of January, the First Minister announced to Parliament the deployment of additional funding of £28 million in 2014-15 for free school meals and the extension of childcare for two-year-olds. On the 8th of January, I announced to Parliament that £3.5 million would be available in 2014-15 for workforce expansion in respect of childcare. In addition, to support, in addition, to support our previously announced commitment to tackle the implications of the bedroom tax in 2014-15, £20 million has been provided through the Budget Bill. The other adjustments set out are the exclusion of £143.2 million of NDPB non-cash costs, which do not require parliamentary approval. Uh, these are mainly in relation to charges for depreciation and impairments and include bodies in our NDPB community, such as the National Institutions, Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Natural Heritage. The exclusion of judicial salaries and Scottish water loan repayments to the National Loans Fund and Public Works Loan Board, which again do not require parliamentary approval, and the inclusion of police loan charges to be approved as part of the Budget Bill. There are technical accounting adjustments to the budget of £132.7 million reflecting differences in the way Her Majesty's Treasury budget for these items and how we are required to account for them under international financial reporting standards-based accounting rules. IFRS-based accounting was introduced across central government from the 1st of April 2009, and I would remind the committee that the conversion to an IFRS basis is spending power neutral. The adjustments to portfolio budgets to reflect the requirement that a number of direct funded and external bodies require separate parliamentary approval. These include National Records of Scotland, the Forestry Commission, Teachers and NHS Pensions, the Food Standards Agency, the Scottish Court Service, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator and the Scottish Housing Regulator. And the restatement of specific grants included in the overall 2014-15 Local Authority Settlement, which remain under the control of the appropriate Cabinet Secretary with policy responsibility. Full details of all grants treated in this way are included in the summary table on page 73. I would again make clear that these are essentially technical adjustments and do not change in any way the budget that has so far been scrutinised by this and other committees and approved in principle by Parliament. Um, I would also remind members that for the purposes of the Budget Bill, only spending which scores as capital in the Scottish Government's or direct funded bodies' annual accounts is shown as capital. This means that capital grants are shown as operating in the supporting document. The full capital picture is shown in Table 1.3 on page 4. Um, as I made clear to Parliament last week, I remain committed to an open and constructive approach to the 2014 budget process and continue to seek agreement on a budget which will meet the needs of the people of Scotland. And I look forward to addressing these issues with the Committee this morning.
Uh, thank you uh, very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm going to invite questions from members uh, of the committee. Just to remind everyone that uh, um, the Cabinet Secretary's officials are allowed to speak at stage two of deliberations today. Questions? Gavin. Gavin. Followed by Jamie. Um, Cabinet Secretary, just a few questions around the, the supporting document uh, to which you just referred. Page 55 um, of that document. For, for 14.50, and about kind of halfway down that table, Queen's, there's an entry for Queen's Ferry Crossing of £288 million pounds for 2014-15. When I looked in the, the budget document itself, or the, sorry, the draft budget document from September, that had a figure of £241 million. Pounds. Has, has that been increased, or is there, is there a technical reason for the difference in those two figures? Um, that's it's essentially an accounting um, issue, uh, convener, which relates to the expected accounting release of the prepayment element of the fourth replacement crossing, which was, of course, the um, arrangement we reached with the United Kingdom government in um, 2010, it would be, if my memory serves me correctly, which enabled us to um, essentially... Um, bring forward elements of the costs of the Queen's Ferry crossing um, on the basis that they would be um, made good at a later stage to enable um, more spending capacity at that stage. Okay. And the other issue from that document is page um, page 60 of that document um, talks the Scottish Futures Fund. Um, the only entry... Um, and the document I have is the Warm Homes Fund, whereas the draft budget itself has a Warm Homes Fund and a Future Transport Fund under that heading. So I'm just wondering if you can explain. Uh, regrettably, Kavir, when the, um, the printed document um, went to press, the Future Transport Fund line was omitted. Um, when we spotted that, we altered it on the online version, and I... Sorry that we haven't uh, specified that to the committee. We should have done that. Okay. Um, I'd like, for the, for just for the record, to convene the um, Future Transport Fund um, was £7.7 um, million in 13-14 and is uh, shown as £18.7 million in 14-15. Okay. And just further to that, the, again, on, on the, the printed document, are the figures for the Warm Homes Fund in the printed document correct or, do, or have they kind of combined warm homes and future transport maybe just for the record what are the correct figures for the warm homes fund um, the the numbers I had just for, for if I just go through all the detail here the, the warm homes fund is um, in 1415 operating expenditure of 5.3 capital of 26 total 31.3 um, and the future transfer fund is uh, operating expenditure of 18.7, um, total 18.7, giving uh, a global total of 24 million operating, 26 million in um, capital, and 50 million in total. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, convene, of course, uh, one of the uh, changes uh, from the draft, it uh, was as the Cabinet Secretary referred to uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, money that's been allocated for discretion housing payments and uh, for free school meals. I just want to uh, explore that a little further. Uh, obviously, the £20 million that's been allocated has been welcomed by uh, this committee and the Welfare Reform Committee and their uh, budget scrutiny. But, of course, how much can be spent on discretion housing payments is contingent on the Department of Work and Pensions uh, funding. Uh, and there has been a previous indication by the Department of Work and Pensions they are likely to cut the amount they are uh, uh, investing in uh, discretion housing payments uh, this year. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there's been no final announcement. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary is aware of uh, where the Department of Work and Pensions is, if there's been any contact. The, the, there's, there's nothing that leads me to change my uh, the, the, the view that I have about the available resources that we have and how that relates to the uh, funding available from the Department of Work and Pensions. So the one caveat I would put in is that I... 
Um, I haven't yet had a readout of um, the housing um, minister's meeting yesterday with Lord Freud, um, unless there is something that's come out of that that I'm not yet aware of. But um, certainly the assumption that um, there is the capacity for us to allocate £20 million pounds, um, as the maximum that we can make available through the discretionary housing payments, which of course is a product of how much the DWP are putting into this, uh, remains the position of set out in the budget. Uh, presumably you, you would join with us in calling the DWP not to uh, undertake a cut to the money they're investing? No, and it would also it would make, um, it would obviously increase our capacity to act in this area if the DWP was to increase the amount of money that they're prepared to put into this. Uh, turn to the free school meals. Uh, I wonder if you could set out again how, how many uh, are likely to benefit uh, by this and what the uh, the cost saving is for uh, the average cost saving is for a family. Um, the, the average cost saving for a family, um, for, for a, per child, will be if they order three hundred pounds per annum. Um, the number of individuals um, affected is um, not a number I think I have in front of me, um, convener. Um, but if uh, if I do come across that, I, I'll do, I'll write to the committee about that point. And part of the motivation, presumably, is obviously families are uh, under pressure at this time in terms of the, the uh, cost of living. So this uh, money, presumably, part of the, the rationale for the government is to help families out at this time. Do you think the £300 will be of uh, benefit to them? It certainly contributes to um, assisting families at um, a time when they're under um, some significant financial pressure. And obviously, it also assists to removing some of the, um, uh, the stigma that's associated with uh, free school meals. That's fine. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Malcolm, to be followed by Jean. Um, we've had this conversation before, but I do welcome uh, free school meals. Uh, but I, I do have one question about that because it's been raised by um, people in Edinburgh, the problem being that there are some practical difficulties in certainly one very local school to me I know of, but I imagine it must be the case in other schools across Scotland which have small dining rooms and the one I'm thinking of is struggling at present to um, provide meals to the limited number of children who have meals, so presuming that the number will increase significantly over uh, because of the free school meal policy, I wonder if the government's had any representation on that issue or given any thought to the problems that may arise for some local authorities in that regard. We certainly um, acknowledge the issues that Mr Chisholm raises, and um, it's an issue that um, will be discussed between the government and COSLA as we take forward the implementation of the free school meals um, uh, policy proposition. Uh, clearly, um, we We'll need to work very closely with local government about taking forward this part of the agenda. But uh, you know, we, we've not had any um, formal representations from um, COSLA on that point. But there, there's ongoing discussions that are taking place. Okay, Malcolm. Jean. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I wanted to ask just about the 20 million that's been allocated to welfare uh, reform mitigation. And uh, it's been raised, I know, a, a couple of times in the chamber where you've been uh, challenged, Cabinet Secretary, to spend £50 million. And uh, there's a, your response has always been that there's a, a, a clear line um, of either guidance or legislation that allows £20 million. And I wonder two things. How is the £20 million calculated and... Uh, I guess dispersed and what restricts you and to, to spending the 50 million that uh, is according to the opposition uh, party main opposition party eligible for, that you could spend this money if you so wished the, the essentially the, the, the sum of 20 million is a product of the um, what I believe and what the government believes is the only legal route that we have to act in this area of policy. Um, the, the issues of benefits are uh, reserved issues and um, if, we are, um, if we are acting in these areas we must do so with a legal foundation to our uh, ability to spend. 
And that opportunity, I think, exists through discretionary housing payments, where um, essentially we are um, entitled to spend a sum of money which, um, <coughs> by the calculation of what, which is a product of the amount of money the DWP is prepared to allocate on discretionary housing payments, and that's essentially the formula that gets us to £20 million um, as a maximum. Now, um, I, I, I think the legal framework here is very clear, that we can spend to that maximum, and, um, the, uh, and that is permissible and acceptable, and the guidance in the DWP supports that. Uh, clearly, if there is a demand beyond that for discretionary housing payments, then um, we have a particular challenge on our hands, given the fact that um, we, we have a, a legal limit on what we can actually allocate in this respect. Uh, I have made clear to Parliament that I am exploring um, with the other parties whether there is any other available route beyond that, and I'm very open to considering what that might be. Um, but I think Parliament will understand that it has, you know, for me to be able to authorise spend, it has to be a legal route for me to authorise that spend. Um, and that work is still ongoing, those discussions are still underway, and uh, I remain committed to trying to find out um, any other ways in which we can take that forward. Uh, the other way in which this could be increased, of course, um, would be if the DWP was to either put in more money itself, which would then inflate the amount of money that we could put in, which would get us closer to the £50 million total, or um, that the DWP could uh, remove the cap, which exists on how much additional resource we can put into that and enable us to act further. So I suppose, um, although I should be very careful how I use the words that I'm about to use with the committee, it's less about the money and more about the mechanism that we have to address. Um, you know, if Parliament wishes to put more money into this, then you know, I, would be, I would meet the challenge of finding out where that money would come from. It would mean us taking money from A to give to B. And it's, you know, like, there's always choices that can be made. Of course there are. But crucially, um, this hinges on the identification of the mechanism that would enable us to do something really quite precise, which is to make a regular payment to an individual to meet a particular liability. And if we do that, we have to have a means of making that payment legally, because the legal entitlement, mostly in um, statute for the payment of regular payments to individuals, is the benefits system, which are entirely reserved, with the exception of discretionary housing payments. So it's, uh, I suppose the best way to sum it up, convener, is perhaps to say it's less about the money and more about the mechanism. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Convener. Uh, can I just clarify, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that the £20 million has been made available under the, the current um, criteria for DHP. Uh, is that ring-fenced or not? And can you give an explanation as to how we can ensure that that DHP funding that you've provided for that specific purpose can be put to uh, support those who need it most? The, 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 the DHP is not ring-fenced. Um, but what we have tried to do is to um, agree a mechanism for its distribution which reflects the areas of greatest need in terms of the payment of DHPs. And I think that's a, um, a, a process that we should constantly monitor to ensure that we have that distribution arrangement correct, um, uh, to ensure that the resources are going to the individuals that um, actually require that assistance as effectively as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, that's concluded the questions from uh, members of the committee. We now turn to the formal proceedings of the Budget Scotland Number 3 Bill. We have no amendments to deal with, but are obliged to consider each section and schedule and the long title and agree formally to each. We will take the sections in order, with schedules being taken immediately after the section that introduces them and the long title last. Fortunately, standing orders allows us to put a single question with groups of sections or schedules that are to be considered consecutively, and unless members disagree, that is what I propose to do. 
and an indicator agreement. Firstly, the question is at section 1, schedule 1, section 2, schedule 2, section 3, schedule 3, and sections 4 to 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That in stage two consideration of the Budget Scotland number three bill. I'd like to thank the um, the Cabinet Secretary. Oh, sorry, one just one one thing. Um, the um, question is that the long title be agreed to. Now, are we all agreed to the long title? Yes. Apologies for that, members. And uh, that does, in fact, end stage two consideration of the Budget Scotland number three bill. So I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his participation this morning. I'll just have a couple of minutes uh, recess into an order uh, Cabinet Secretary and his officials to leave. At the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore now close the public part of this meeting.